today's uh, cooking class of asparagus, pan fried halibut, and or quinoa is brought to you today, today by Lever Health. Lever Health is a personalized health coaching platform designed to help you eat better, move better, and sleep better where members get a dedicated health coach who will work one-on-one -on -one with you to figure out what getting healthier means for you. With that, I'm gonna hand over everything to Chris, let him introduce himself, um, his background, where he got started, where he teaches now, et cetera, uh, so that we can eat better over the next 35 to 40 minutes, and then there's a Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much, Chris, they're all yours. All right, thanks, Kevin. Hey there, folks. Uh, I hope you're having a good uh, evening. Uh, I'm here on the uh, West Coast out in Seattle um, in uh, um, uh, Pacific time zone. So it's not quite the evening for me. It's late afternoon. It'll be an early dinner. Um, I am a, um, I, I was in the corporate world for a long, long time and, and uh, kind of dropped out of that and uh, um, decided to go to culinary school a few years back. I uh, went out to uh, uh, Seattle Culinary Academy, and uh, which is the uh, oldest culinary school uh, west of the Mississippi. So it's it's been around here for a long time. Um, really enjoyed that process. Spent a couple of years there, and uh, while I was there, started working as a tutor for cooking theory. Really, kind of fell in love with the science behind cooking, like understanding why a thing um, uh, uh, behaves the way it does uh, without. Uh, um, I, I, I got a little bored of hearing uh, uh, myths about food and those kind of things. So I always kind of like uh, like to look that kind of stuff up and, and see what's happening there. Some of my heroes are, uh, you know, like Kenji. I, if y'all are foodies, you probably know um, uh, who, who Kenji is. Um, he, uh, and then uh, Michael Roman, uh, uh, you know, and folks like that. People who like to ask questions about why, um, why we are, um, uh, Cooking the way we do, and uh, why we, uh, you know, why we need to uh, add acid to proteins and those kind of things to, uh, um, you know, because you know, good for firming things up and uh, um, good for firming up proteins and, and those kind of things. So um, after uh, uh, graduating from the culinary school, uh, I went on, spent a little bit of time working in some restaurants. I uh, figured, uh, uh, you know, I had to do my time working the line and, and that that kind of thing, and. Uh, um, and then came back to the school um, uh, to teach. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing right now too. Um, I am a, uh, a part-time instructor there, uh, also a substitute teacher. Uh, and uh, um, I teach uh, a variety of classes, largely revolving around theory. Um, uh, sometimes I sub out into the kitchen as well with the, uh, uh, with the chef instructors that are there. And, um, and then I also teach knife skills. Uh, so I teach uh, uh, first quarter students uh, uh, how to go from like, holy cow, I've never held a knife before in my life to uh, being fairly proficient in understanding basic cuts like broom laws and uh, small dices and medium dices and what the difference is from those. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's uh, 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 a passion that I discovered late in life. And uh, um, I've always had a passion for food, but it was uh, uh, teaching is what the, uh, uh, what really kind of uh, bit me in. Uh, I like it a lot. So I'm uh, pretty excited to work with you all here today. Um, for those of you who joined early, you might have heard uh, what I was saying before and why we're choosing the things that we're doing, why we're choosing the, uh, the ingredients that we're working with, uh, largely because it's um, um, uh, the seasonality behind it. Uh, the school is pretty big on sustainability, seasonality, and just trying to stick with those concepts. And, uh, and it's something that speaks to me as well. Um, so halibut, we get fresh halibut here in the Pacific Northwest down from Alaska uh, um, whenever the season's open. And, uh, and that's from uh, uh, March until, uh, until around October. Uh, the schedule kind of fluctuates a little bit depending on like what the fish are doing, but um, uh, it's a heavy re regulated uh, uh, fishing environment uh, to uh, promote uh, sustainability. And so we can continue to eat halibut for a long, long time. Um, so we're going with that. Uh, we're going with asparagus. Asparagus is in season right now here in Washington. Growing up, I was never a real big fan of asparagus because uh, I wasn't getting really good asparagus, I think. Um, understanding when it's ready and uh, when it's coming out of the ground and uh, where to look for that. Uh, here in Washington, we have wonderful, wonderful asparagus farms. We're kind of known for it. Um, so 
I, I, I really like to eat it around this time of the year, and I love to marry it with, um, uh, with halibut. The, uh, um, then the gremolata, the, the gremolata is just a, it's a, it's a nice uh, traditional Italian condiment uh, that, uh, that goes really well with the halibut, goes really well with asparagus, goes really well with the quinoa. And we chose quinoa because, uh, you know, it's a complete protein. And if you're not, uh, uh, if you're not actually having the halibut, uh, uh, it will, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be a, a good sustainable meal for you for, for the rest of the, rest of the day. Um, if you are a, a wine drinker and you're wondering about uh, pairings for this kind of food, I would recommend since uh, 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 you, you could go with a white wine, a dry white wine, uh, another good one would be like a Pinot Noir. Um, just because it's a lighter wine and tends to um, uh, go nicely with the delicate nature of the halibut. So with the halibut, it is a, um, uh, an extremely lean fish. So it's a lot different than something like salmon. Salmon's very, very fatty. Um, because halibut's a really lean fish, it really lends itself well to um, uh, cooking in fats uh, like butter and, uh, and olive oil. Though the menu, says that we're going to pan sear it. It's gonna be a light sear. It's not gonna be a hard sear like you would do with a steak. Um, more what we're going to be doing is trying to uh, tease that butter a little bit to try to get it to uh, um, uh, brown just a wee little bit. We don't wanna burn it. Um, if, we, if we brown it just a little bit, it just has a lot more uh, flavor. Basically uh, what's happening there is uh, um, it's the, the same effect you might get if you were cooking a steak or something like that. It's called a Maillard reaction. Um, so we're browning the, uh, the milk solids in there just a little bit. And um, in that, um, that nice brown flavor will uh, come through into the halibut pretty nicely. Um, the, uh, uh, and then, yeah, with the asparagus, we're gonna blanch it. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, and then put the gremolata on top. The reason why we like the gremolata is what we're dealing with here with the halibut, you know, we've got, um, we've got the, the fattiness from the butter, um, the delicate flavor of the halibut. And anytime that you're cooking, you really wanna think about a couple of concepts. Uh, and uh, one of those is, um, you know, you might be familiar with that book, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Um, you know, there's components that basically make up all sorts of dishes. And, uh, uh, and that's kind of the point of that book. There are some other components as well, um, but uh, we are gonna be playing with salt and we're gonna be playing with, uh, with the acid and the acid in the or the gremolata is what's going to add the acid to this uh uh, uh to this uh, to the fish dish which you're going to need because of that fat but then we're also going to be using pine nuts and that's going to add texture so you want uh if you have that fattiness you really want to have the acid that cuts through and makes that makes it uh just taste bright and uh not muddy or anything like that and then uh uh it's really important whenever you're taking a bite out of your food that you get that nice crunch and texture so uh yeah we're trying to bring all those components together. So um, I recommend we go ahead and get started. Uh, what we're going to need is to uh, um, uh, get our blanching water started and also get our ice bath going and get our quinoa going. So we kind of want to get all of these things going uh, uh, as close to the same time as possible uh, because our quinoa is going to take the longest time to cook, but it doesn't require any, um, uh, it doesn't require much supervision from us. So I'm going to get going with that right now. And while you're doing that, Chris, we did have one question around how do you select the right piece of halibut? Halibut. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so in order to select the right piece of halibut, I go to, so first off, I go to a, um, a fishmonger that's right up the way from me that I, uh, um, that I trust a lot. Um, they have, um, what we're going to do first here, before I answer that question, we're going to take our one cup of quinoa that we have, and we're going to rinse this off just because it gets, um, uh, it can be a little bit gritty. So I'm going to step away from the camera for a second as I go over to the sink and spray that off. I'm going to put it in a colander uh, and then I'm going to um, uh, put this in the pot here. Uh, yeah, so when choosing the halibut, it depends on what you're looking for because uh, what we're going for tonight is uh, uh, more of a filet style than a steak style. I'm going to look for um, uh, the right cut, make sure that I'm getting a filet uh, as opposed to a steak. And then from there, 
I'm going to look at the fish itself. So um, a lot of places will allow you to um, smell the fish. It's a little harder to do in our current environment right now, but um, it will, they will allow you to smell the fish. And what you want, uh, the, the odor that should come off of this should be a slight hint of the sea. So it shouldn't be overly fishy, but you should get a little bit of a, of a, of a sea scent. Then for halibut, halibut's really, really, really white. And you want to make sure that flesh looks super white. So I can show you here. Come down to that bottom camera. Let me see our halibut, our filet that we have here. You can kind of see how white that is right there. A lot of times what you'll get with halibut is the skin that's going to go on. I'll show you how to remove that. The skin typically isn't edible without a lot of work. Um, you can certainly make it edible, but you have to trim off the fat and then you have to dehydrate it and then you can fry it. And that's really nice. It creates these little nice little halibut skin crispies that you can do on pot. Um, so yeah, you're, uh, you're looking for it to be super white. You want the cut that you want. You want a good fish purveyor. And um, if you do have the opportunity to smell it, uh, you will, uh, you will want to do that. So I'm going to grab the oil. Kevin, I'm going to move the camera here. So I'll let you know whenever it's ready to flip back on. Let's go back to this one. Okay, go ahead and switch to that bottom camera and let's see. We're pretty close. I'm going to raise it real fast here. Sorry for the jiggles, everyone. That's probably the best we're get. I'll just show you what we're doing here. All right, so we're turning up the heat for our quinoa. And what we want to do is we just kind of want to toast that. It's a little bit wet, and so we're getting the, uh, the moisture out of the quinoa. And we have in the recipe to add a, a teaspoon of olive oil. Um, I typically don't measure this out. Um, feel free to go ahead and do it. I have a squirt bottle that I use, see like this right here. And then I'll just kind of spray that in. And you can see in here what's going on. They're moving that around. So I'm using high heat right now to get that, just so it's just kind of sizzling, getting rid of the water, and I'm trying to coat it with a bit of the olive oil. And while that goes, I'm gonna drop the heat down just a little bit more because I don't wanna burn it. And I'm gonna move over now to my blanching pot because uh, that is our other long-term thing that we have. So I'm going to take that pot and I'm going to put just a little bit of salt in it. By a little bit, you're talking about uh, uh, probably two tablespoons. Again, it's not uh, a precise measurement that we need to work with right here because we're just seasoning the water. We're allowing that salt to help firm up and brighten the asparagus. And I'm going to get that going on the burner. I'm not going to cover it for now because I just want it to get boiling. The quinoa is a nice little sizzle, and you can smell it. It's kind of got that nice, nutty, grainy quinoa flavor. We like that a lot. We want to avoid having any sticks down on the bottom there. But once we get to that point, then you can kind of smell it, and you see the water is gone and the oil's coated it. What you do is you take your one and three quarter cup of water, which is what we've got right here, and we're just going to pour that in. I'm going to crank you, the heat back up. Do you use tap oh, water or do you uh, filter your water? Um, I use, here in Washington, we are in Seattle, we, have, we actually have really nice water. Um, so I do not filter my water. Um, we do have, uh, I have filtered water in the refrigerator. It takes a long time for it to go through. But uh, I particularly like the water here in Washington, so I, I don't filter it. It's a good question. Though. So I'm going to cover that for just a second here. and. Uh, um, but I'm going to go back and look at it a few times. Ultimately, what we want to do is get it to where it's boiling. 
Um, and then we're gonna turn the heat down super low, down to a simmer, and we're gonna let that thing go for 15 minutes. I've got a little back burner here that I'm turning on right now to, uh, to just kind of move that over to. So while we're waiting on those items, what we're going to want to do is grab our pine nuts. Uh, pine nuts, are these wonderful guys right here. Uh, we can't just eat pine nuts just straight. Um, we need to toast them as well. So um, we're going to do a little bit of pine nut toasting here. Let me get you a good burner to show you. Move our quinoa. Okay, let me see, we've got this pan here. This is the same pan I'm gonna use for the halibut. Um, and I'm probably not even gonna clean the, uh, uh, the pine nuts off of it, uh, uh, or the fat that's left over from the pine nuts, because I think it's just gonna add a little bit of flavor to the halibut. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll leave that as is, and then just move over to that pan when I'm ready to, to do the halibut. So what I'm doing now is I've got it down at a um, flame that's, uh, that's about medium high. And what I want is for the pan to get a little warm, you can put your hand over it and feel it, it just takes a couple seconds. Comes on your burner, I suppose. And what we want to do is just toast these little guys up just a little bit because we can't just eat them raw. Um, they don't taste very good that way. They tend to be a little astringent, uh, a little bitter. So we let those go. That won't take very long. Uh, what I'm looking for is for them to brown just a little bit and just ever so slightly. And then when that happens, I'm going to pull them off the heat and I'm just going to put them aside. They don't need to be super hot whenever we're um, uh, using them because they're just going to be basically a garnish for us. And you'll know whenever they get really close because they start to release their fat um, and they'll start sticking to the pan a little bit. That'll only take a, take a couple of minutes. All right, my quinoa is boiling now. And so I'm gonna move that down to a simmer. I'm gonna note the time. And or set a timer for 15 minutes. <laughs> Once we hit 15 minutes on the quinoa, we're just going to take it off the heat and uh, and leave it covered, and uh, um, and then just let it sit until we're about ready to serve, and then we'll fluff it up. So you see now how I was able to move those around before, and the uh, maybe if I. Turn this light off real fast. You can see it just a little better. It looks like there's a little glare. There, that's a little better. So um, now they're starting to stick. They're also starting to get flavorful. And you see here, we've got our browning that's happening. Now, the second that happens, they'll start to really brown and they'll brown a bit on their own as well. So really what you're looking for is how I used to be able to slide those things around and they're all just kind of sticking because the, the fat's coming out. And it should smell really nice and toasty. Definitely don't want to burn them. Uh, then they get quite astringent. Is there a color you're looking for in terms of how dark brown they are to be toasted? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, you can yeah. kind of see them right here. Yeah. So you see how how we got these guys, and they're even still browning a little bit more because that fat's pretty pretty hot. Um, don't touch them when the fat comes out like that because um, that'll that'll definitely burn you. But yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what you're looking for that light brown. And it doesn't matter, it, they don't need to be uh, browned all the way around um, on all the sides. Once one end is starting to really brown, then it can, it can go. But feel free to move them around a whole lot and, and get them nice and brown. All right, so I'm gonna put those aside in my little mise en place area. And I have my pan, still gonna use that pan for the halibut. And I'm going to give the quinoa, just for fun, I'm going to give it just a quick little spin. So I'm stirring it real fast here because uh, just to make sure it's not sticking to the bottom. Depending on the pans you have, that, that can happen if they're, really, if they're really thin down there. So yeah, what we have going now is our quinoa. We have our pine nuts toasted and we have the blanching water is almost at a boil. So the next thing I'm going to do is 
get my ice bath going, and I'm going to show you how to prepare the asparagus. By the time we have those things set up, then we should have a, uh, um, a nice hot blanching water. All right. So. If anyone has so, questions for Chris as they go, feel free to drop them in the chat, and I'll ask them. Quick. Sounds like you're grabbing some ice. Yeah, I am. So um, what we have here, see if we can get the camera up in there. Um, you know, it's not a massive amount of ice, but um, I would say probably about an ice, maybe an ice tray's worth, thereabouts. So, yeah, uh, we're just gonna take that and we wanna put some cold water over that. And again, this is our, um, this is the water that we're gonna use to stock the asparagus. If we, um, if we were to blanch it without shocking it, what would happen is, is the asparagus would continue to cook. Um, it's kind of a, what we'd call carryover cooking. And, uh, and we don't want it to continue doing that. So I'm just kind of breaking the ice cubes off the side there. So I have a nice um, uh, uh, bowl of water here that's going to, is, the size you're gonna go with is the, um, you know, look at the asparagus you're going to use and uh and just make sure it's going to fit in that bowl um and that the water will cover it wash my hands real fast and then we'll go on to the asparagus okay so asparagus this is uh Nice asparagus that we got here. Um, one little thing that I like to do, anytime anything comes with uh, rubber bands, you know, just uh, pop those off. Um, it's good to uh, um, cut them open. What happens is, is uh, you know, if these go into the garbage, they make it out to a landfill, um, then birds can eat them. And then when they're, with their, if they're broken open, they can, uh, it doesn't uh, do bad things to their insides. Uh, so, it's the thing I always try to remember to do is pop those open. Um, gets ingrained into your head um, uh, at the Culinary Academy. So asparagus, these are really nice ones too. This is the time of the year where I, uh, I really enjoy them. Um, there is a woody end right here. Um, and you can probably see it um, where there's like little lines and striations. It's not necessarily the purple, but in this particular piece, it does fall along that. You can go with the, uh, um, the tried and true easy method where you just kind of bend it in your hand, kind of put a thumb right there, and it'll break right about the spot where the woody parts are um, and where they end. If you want to be a little more precise about it, I'm gonna move the camera over. And then Kevin, if you don't mind giving a shot on the cutting board there. Okay, so where asparagus. And I'm gonna look and see, you know, the striations are right around there. You can kind of feel it. We take our knife and cut right there. Nice little bias cut and, and pop off there. Totally fine. It depends on the presentation that you're looking for. Um, if you don't want a, uh, uh, a real rustic view, feel free to do this. I, I tend to just pop through pretty fast. I, I, I find the, um, the sound and the feeling of them popping to be pretty gratifying. So I tend to just go that way. Um, if I'm in a more of a fine dining uh, scenario, then uh, yes, you know, we're gonna go through and what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a nice bias cut that's on there and, uh, and make them all around the same size. But, uh, but again, this is perfectly fine if you're eating for, uh, um, uh, yourself and you're not serving a whole bunch of people a, a, a fancy meal so so we have going on there i'm gonna watch these guys off real fast and down right here and now we'll check our blanching water and our blanching water at least mine anyways is uh, is boiling so we'll move the blanching water over a little closer to the camera.
And again, this is just lightly salted water. We want it to be at a nice rolling boil. And what we're going to do is we're just going to put that asparagus into that pot. Be careful not to burn yourself. And we're going to go for about 10 seconds. It doesn't go for very long, 10 to 15 seconds. Depends on the size of your asparagus. If you're getting really tiny, skinny ones, you know, it might go for a little less time. If you're getting real big ones, it might go for a little more. What I'm looking for, bring it over here to show you. You see how nice and green that is right there? And it's gonna get a little tender on the outside. And just to be clear, that, one, so. that was the water that was okay. already boiling before. That's correct, yes. That's the salted boiling water. Okay, and now it's blanched. And so what we're gonna do now is shock it. And we're just gonna pop it right into that ice bath. So yeah, these are really, really nice fresh asparagus here. You can see just how bright and white that is on that end and then really nice and green there. Just really good stuff, smells delicious. So I'm gonna just stick my hands in there, mix it up, nice and cold. And then I'm just gonna set it aside. So uh, really what we're doing is we're letting that asparagus just chill back down. We're gonna cook it again. Um, we're gonna uh, finish it right at the very end in a, uh, in a saute pan. A little olive oil. Okay, so I'm gonna take my, we no longer need our asparagus uh, blanching water, so you can move that pot aside. You won't need it again. All right, so at this point, we have um, our quinoa is rolling, pine nuts are ready to go, and our asparagus is blanched. So we're gonna make the gremolata next. Again, the gremolata, just a traditional Italian condiment. Goes really, really, really well on a lot of things. We're gonna make enough here that um, you will potentially have leftovers. Um, the, because we're only gonna do a little dollop, it's pretty intense. Uh, it's got a strong garlicky flavor. Uh, we're only going to do a little uh, uh, dollop on the halibut, but if as you're eating it, obviously, you, know, you throw some more on there and, uh, and enjoy that. Um, it also goes great in the quinoa. What I found is the amount that we make here, it's, uh, it's a perfect amount because the, uh, uh, the quinoa is about four servings. That one cup is, uh, is about four servings. To, uh, if you take about three quarters of the gremolata that we made and just dump that all in the quinoa and mix it all up, that's pretty good. That's one way to do it. Uh, we're going to, uh, uh, for us, we're going to just uh, top it with the gremolata, but it's, uh, it's a great way to go. Also works really nice as leftovers. Uh, that quinoa bowl with all the gremolata in there um, is delicious cold. So really, really, really good stuff. So let's get our ingredients for the gremolata. What we have here we have some parsley. I so I to the cutting board. Oops, so, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so we have uh, some uh, flat leaf parsley here. If you have curly parsley, that's totally fine. It's it's fine to fine to do that. I personally prefer flat leaf. Um, I, um, for no real reason other than you know, I, I just like it. Um, but uh, curly parsley is fine too. We have a lemon. We have some chili flakes. Uh, that is optional, but uh, it adds a little uh, bite to it. Two cloves of garlic and a cup of olive oil. By the way, the um, one little trick I can tell you with olive oil is uh, I tend to not cook with olive oil a whole lot. I use olive oil um, uh, more as uh, um, a topping over pasta. Um, I use it in uh, uh, condiments and um, uh, uh, dressings and things like that. Uh, just, I, I, I like the, the taste kind of, of, of raw olive oil. This is a pretty easy to get brand uh, that I think tastes pretty good. It's fairly mellow. It's not overly grassy. Um, but what I like to do is uh, um, I like to store my olive oil in, uh, in squirt bottles, small amounts of it but then buy the bigger containers. And then you can store these containers off in your, uh, in your pantry. 
um, uh, or your cupboards or what have you. What's nice about that is it's a little bit cheaper. You can get better olive oil usually in this form factor. And if you're moving it into smaller containers, it's not gonna get rancid. Uh, so like I said, I like to have my olive oil raw. I like to taste the flavors of it and I don't cook with it a whole heck of a lot. So uh, you want it to be uh, pretty fresh all the time. So when I'm going with a half cup of olive oil, um, you know, obviously I'm gonna pour it out of the big giant container, but if I'm like squirting olive oil into little things here and there, then I have the little squirt bottle. So, good stuff. Uh, olive oil tasting, if you have an opportunity to do that, I highly, uh, highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's shocking how different olive oil, different types of olive oil taste. So, um, we're gonna go with our parsley here. And again, um, the trick with parsley, so with this one, we're going with, uh, we want a cup, about a cup of uh, uh, packed parsley. Okay, so we have a little measuring cup that we have here. And it's typically, it's fine if there's stems in there. I find the stems can be a little bit bitter, um, but really to pick it, you know, we're just gonna grab these pieces like that. And it's, it is fine for there to be stems. I'm not gonna use massive amounts of them. This is a particularly stemmy batch. Um, so I'm gonna throw the rest of those in compost. But, you know, we'll just kinda pick all that off. You know, check your parsley if it's a little dirty. Um, you should wash it. The, uh, I washed this earlier. Have you heard of the uh, fork shortcut for parsley? I haven't, no. Taking Tell a fork and using it to scrape the parsley to take the leaves off. Oh, interesting. We learned that in our, lots of little in our knife skills class uh, about a month ago. She grabbed the fork okay. and said, I'm going to change your life, and I'm going to use that to scrape off all the leaves from the stems. How did it work? It works really well. Yeah, yeah, cool. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, you just get used to, like, one of the things you have to do uh, um, in school and in a restaurant is just pick parsley. Um, and so you'll just sit there and just boom, 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 boom. I'm going a little slow right now, so I don't get too far ahead of people. But, uh, but yeah, so that's um, close to what we're looking for. We're just going to stuff it in this cup just to get a, get a sense. We're kind of in the right ballpark. Feel pretty good about that. So that's kind of what that's going to look like. Put my parsley aside, put my workstation. Curly parsley is uh, probably going to poop out just a little bit more. So something to bear in mind, you might want just a titch more of the parsley. Where our bench scrapers are really handy. Get all that up. So then our next step. is our garlic. Um, I'm a, um, not a fan of smashing garlic. Oh, and we got one with a, little, a bunch of little sub uh, What can happen um, when you're smashing garlic is it can make it, uh, it can make it astringent, it can make it a little bit bitter. Um, you break up that, uh, wow, another sub -plate. that's great. Um, you can, uh, uh, you smash that germ, the germ from time to time can be a little, uh, can be a little bitter. Um, so I like to be a little more delicate and careful with my garlic. You never know what that germ is going to be like. There's definitely a big debate where people are like, oh, well, you know, you don't have to remove the germ. Um, you know, it's actually sweet. It's just, but really, I mean, if you just pop that out and try it, like uh, um, about half the time, it's pretty bitter. And again, since we're not cooking this, um, we want to kind of treat the ingredients really well. Uh, so, uh, um, it all just kind of comes together and we don't have any surprises. So the way that I deal with garlic um, is, and it, that's another one where there's lots of little tricks for it and everything, but I'll just cut it in half. I leave this tip on, you can see that tip right there. I leave that tip on right there. That's like, just kind of like the root. The reason why I hold on to that is because that's connected to the germ, right? And so I just stick my thumb right into there and I just pull it and then that whole germ just kind of pops right out. Kind of a fast way to go. What a lot of people do is they'll kind of cut both ends off and then like you kind of have to dig in for the germ or you ignore the germ. Um, since I don't like to ignore the germ, that's what I do. 
you're in a big hurry though, you can always smash it or use a garlic press or something along those lines, but uh, <laughs> um, it's not a direction that I like to go. And there we go. So we have our two cloves of garlic, pretty ready to go. Um, what I like to do then too, I know we are gonna be using a food processor, but um, I, I, I like to help the food processor out a little bit. Uh, so we don't get big chunks of raw garlic in the in the gremolata. So what I'll do is uh, I'll just give it a quick little chop. Okay, close that off of there. And maybe another round through there. Not gonna fully mince or anything like that. Just give it, just chop it up a little bit. I uh, made this gremolata the other night, and just for fun, I did double the amount of garlic. Uh, my wife was yelling at me for the garlic purpose she was having the next day so uh <laughs> um it's the garlic can be pretty intense so we're going to stick with the normal amount of garlic for tonight so i've got my garlic here sitting on the bench scraper i'm going to let that sit for just a second while i take care of my lemon also got to check my time on the uh on the quinoa i think we've gone for about 15 minutes so if you are working your quinoa and you start at the same time as me, now's the time to take it off the heat. Don't take the lid off though, just leave it on and uh, it's gonna continue to kind of cook and fluff up. Okay, so with our lemon, before we cut our lemon, what we wanna do is uh, we wanna zest it. This is an area where if you don't happen to have a zester, um, you can certainly use a microplane. That, uh, that'll work just fine. A little container here and then I'm just going to kind of zest that guy so, yeah if you uh if you've not done zesting or using a recipe it just adds like a um a, a really nice lemon bite um a little bit more intense than just using lemon juice on its own They're pretty close. We're just kind of looking to see where you've got most of that zest off. You smell it. it. Smells delicious. Good thing for cocktails. Orange zest in Manhattan. So um, we now have, I have my food processor. I'm going to move it over so we can all see it. Food processor, pretty much in view. Okay, we don't have to see the top of it. So I'm gonna take my parsley, put that in there. I'm gonna take my garlic, put that in there. And then we're going to juice our lemon. Real quick on the um, on the instead of a zester, you mentioned a micro something. Oh, a micro plane, yeah. This lower camera is going to jiggle a little bit while I get into this drawer. So, all right. Okay, so our micro plane. This is this is one version of micro plane. Another version. It's the same version. <laughs> that that version's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there are multiple kinds. These ones have fairly big squares, but you can use that on the lemon as well. Just go oh, so it's, like a, it's like a cheese grater. It basically, yeah, it's a cheese grater that you hold in your hand. Yeah, so you could totally use a cheese grater uh, for, uh, for zesting if you want to as well. So we're gonna need a little bit of lemon juice for this too. Recipe says that we need one to two teaspoons. So I'm gonna go ahead and juice this guy. If you don't have a juicer, that's totally fine. You can just squeeze the juice. We're not looking for tons and tons and tons of it. It's basically going to be half a lemon, okay? We're gonna leave this other half. We're gonna do something with that a little later. But um, you're looking at about, about half a lemon. So we're gonna put that aside. We're gonna put that with our olive oil, but we're not putting the olive oil in yet. We're not putting the lemon in yet. Um, what we want to do with this is we're going to pulse the, um, the parsley and the garlic 
and the lemon zest, but not the lemon juice, just a couple of times to mix it all up. direction. I'm going to blame the camera angle for being backwards. Okay, so uh, your food processor should have like a pulse uh, in an on button. We're going to be using the pulse button. We're going to pulse that a couple of times. One, two, three. Got to pulse it up. We're looking for that to just kind of chop up there. Just a couple more and I'll show you what I'm looking for here. Now lift the camera up here, try to keep it steady. You can kind of see in there. We'll take the top off. There we go. So that is kind of what you're looking for, okay? Little bit of chopping. Get that top back on. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a measuring spoon for this one. And then pulse a couple of times, and a little bit. Give it another couple pulses. More and the rest, and then one tablespoon, in, grab a teaspoon, take a teaspoon, pop that in, pop that in, so two teaspoons, and then pulse it. And then we're going to add about another um, half teaspoon of salt in there. Still just pulsing. And then what we want to do is taste it. It's going to be kind of intense. Remember, there is that, that garlic that's in there. I mean, this is what we're looking at here. That's kind of, oh, there we go. See what that looks like. There's so a little oil that moves around, a little bit of green. Okay, so make sure salt's all right. That tastes pretty good to me. I think the lemon's about right too. I'm gonna give it just two more pulses, multiply a little bit better. And we're in pretty good shape. We'll clear all this stuff out of our way. Okay, so what you want to do is you want that gramolata. Let's just stick it in a uh, in another little bowl. Don't need the food processor anymore. Move that out of the way. And this is where that little silicone spatula comes in really handy. Get all of that stuff out of there. There we go. Nice little mixture. Um, then what I like to do, just because I like the red pepper flakes, um, you know, you've tasted it and you get a sense for the intensity of it. You can decide if you want that in yours or not. 
So I'm putting in just a little bit there on the top. And then I'm going to, I'm gonna just mix that up with a fork real fast. We're kind of like emulsifying it a little bit more. There we go. Here is our remoulade. Nice and green. So that's gonna look good. Um, it is a green dish. Um, it's a it's a very springy dish across the board. So kind of emphasizing that concept. I'm just gonna take a second here to clear off my station so we can move on to the next part. And that would be the halibut. I'm gonna take that lemon that I had. I'm just gonna put it over there in the lemon juicer just to let it wait. We'll, uh, what we'll do is we'll just cut those up and we'll use it as a garnish um, at the end. Okay. So this is where we're gonna need our fish spatula. We're also going to need our butter. So two ounces of butter is what we're calling for. That's a, that's a fair amount of butter. Um, this is enough for, if you are, if you're cooking for two, this will be enough for two of the filets. It's also a good amount for the one filet too. Um, we'll have a little butter left over in the pan. And uh, what we'll do is we'll top that, uh, um, we'll top the, uh, uh, the fish with a little bit of the butter at the end. So it'll almost kind of create like a little bit of a sauce. That's why we have the extra stuff. Um, but we won't be necessarily eating all of that butter. It's just how it cooks really well in butter. Um, uh, a real common way to go is to um, uh, poach halibut in butter. And that's, uh, that's super delicious as well. Sometimes these fancy burners don't always like to light on their own. So that's why you don't have any hair on my, on my fingers. So um, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and chop it up. I'm just gonna use a thin scraper here because that helps it melt just a little bit better. I've got my burner that I've just started here and I'm just warming it up a little bit. I've got it on uh, uh, pretty low heat. Now I get my halibut. I'm letting that, that burner get warm. Pop that out. So like I said, you've got the skin on the halibut. That's not edible unless you do a lot of work to it. So we're not gonna be eating it today. You might've gotten your halibut with the skin removed already. And if you did, that's great. Um, I can show you a trick for it. Halibut skin's really tough. Um, so uh, it's relatively, you can use that toughness to your advantage. I'm gonna go ahead and put the butter in the pan now. I'm gonna start with about half of it. And I'll show you this pan here. So you can see what we've got going on. So a couple of big pieces of butter there. And we're just gonna let that melt for a second. Again, low, low, low heat. Uh, Cause all we're trying to do is melt the butter up a little bit. So you take your skin and you kind of want to, in some pieces of halibut, you can, you can almost just pull that off, but not all pieces of halibut. Um, if you can get yourself a little corner, you hold onto that and you can pop a little hole in it with your knife so you can hold it a little bit better or you can grab a paper towel. And you just hold onto the skin and then you get your knife and you're gonna tilt the blade down Okay, towards the uh, towards the skin. Okay, so you're not getting the flesh, and you're just gonna wiggle. I'm gonna move that paper towel away so you guys can kind of see. And you're just gonna wiggle the skin. And as you wiggle it, it's just gonna come right off, and you get your skin there. And you were more pulling not even it, really, cutting it with the knife, right? Yeah, I'm, all I'm doing, I'm holding the knife stationary and pointing it down at the skin and then just wiggling the, um, the skin and pulling it towards me. And because that halibut skin is so strong, like it actually takes a lot to, it's a very sharp knife, it takes a lot to, um, to cut through that. So you can, uh, um, 
zoom along pretty nicely and you get that. I got like a little piece of skin that's stuck around. You just nick that guy off. And otherwise we're in pretty good shape. Now we come back over here and we see that our butter, nice and melted. Again, don't crowd your pan whenever you're cooking uh, uh, fish or really any meats. And I'm gonna does turn that, the heat up now. Does okay. that mean if you had a small plan, you would do each filet separately? Yes, yeah. Um, you want the pan, you want the fish to just kind of fit in the pan. Um, if you've got a whole bunch of fish just all smushed together or a whole bunch of pieces of meat smushed together, then what will happen is uh, it lowers the temperature of the meat, um, or sorry, lowers the temperature of the pan, and then the meat ends up mostly just steaming at that point. So I'm gonna move the, uh, um, the low camera here over to the, um, over to the range so y'all can see what's going on with the butter. All right, go ahead and I think this should be good. Let's see what it looks like. All set? Yeah. You see some yeah. good looking butter. Okay. What do you think about the lighting? I feel like that's shining too much. So how about, is that a little better? It's better without the light. Yeah. Better without the light. Okay. So what I've got here is it was, it's bubbling a little bit. It's just finishing with this bubbling, right? And you can see a little bit of milk solids on there. I've got the heat right now at about medium. Heat of the pan is pretty good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of salt to our fish. And I'm just going to put a little salt over top of that fish right there. And that's the end I'm going to lay down onto the pan. Now that I've got the fish on the pan, I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit more. So like I said before, this isn't a real hard sear, right? It's going to gradually get hotter and hotter and hotter um, since we're up to you know, about medium, medium high heat. The main thing that we're watching out for now is that the fish or I'm sorry, that the butter does not burn. Like I said, we want a little bit of browning, but we don't want burning. It's making a nice sizzle right now. So you'll notice with the fish that it's kind of translucent, right? You can kind of see how it's translucent there. What we're looking for, for the, when the fish is cooked is we're looking for it to become an opaque white. And that's really what you, whenever you're cooking white fish, that's one of the main things you're looking for. A lot of times people will say it's like, well, you know, you're gonna cook till it starts to flake. Um, that's often a sign that you've cooked it a little bit too far. Uh, so, so watching for that, um, uh, for that fish to go from uh, translucent to opaque is, is generally a really good thing. We're gonna let it go for approximately three minutes and we've probably been going for about a minute and a half now. And then we're gonna flip it over And in the meantime, we're going to get the pan for our asparagus warm. Okay. Go ahead and flip that guy over now. So what you do here is you've got your fish spatula, right? It or if you've got a regular spatula. What's nice about the fish spatula is it really lets you get under there to slide under the fish. Your fish should not be sticking to the pan. If you use enough butter, then it won't be. And then we'll flip it back over. So you'll see along the edges now, my butter is starting to brown. So I'm gonna turn the heat back down just a little bit. I was up to about medium high. Now I'm down around medium. And you should be able to smell the browning of the butter at this point. Should be getting close. And you can see this fish here this is what I was talking about, about how it becomes a little bit more opaque and less translucent. So what we like to do whenever we're in these situations, when we have this delicious butter going, I'm gonna add these other two pats now, right? So that's gonna cool my butter down just a little bit so it doesn't brown too much. You see how it's nice and bubbly. And then I'm gonna tilt the pan towards me and I've got a spoon and I'm gonna just pour some of that over top of it. You know, basically what I'm doing here is I'm just basting it, getting a little bit more delicious flavor, but I'm also cooking it a little bit on top there. That's how that trucks along. 
gonna get this other burner going now. So you should be warming up your burner for your asparagus. Uh, put it on about medium, and then you're gonna put some olive oil in there. Uh, you know, about a, about a tablespoon. You notice my how it's kind of slowed down a little bit from adding that cold butter. So I'm just gonna play with the heat a little bit more and get a little bit more heat going there. I'm gonna try to lighten how is it still? No, it's still a little too blurry. And if you touch this uh, halibut now, you're probably seeing, because it's not quite three minutes, you touch the bottom of your spatula, you're probably seeing that it's um, just sticking a little bit. That means it's not quite ready. It'll, um, um, the, usually when you're cooking with fish on a, on a pan, uh, that's one of the signs you can tell whenever it's ready to flip or not. If it's sticking, then you need to let it go just a little bit longer. So I checked this one and it was still sticking just a little bit. So you gotta let him go just a little bit more. It'll just kind of release off the pan. So now you're touching it and you can feel, if you remember how it felt when you started, pretty soft. Now it should be firming up as though that protein is just kind of firming up there. I'm gonna go ahead and give her another little flip. Kind of where the, the fat from the skin was there. We put it here. Now I'm going to bring the heat down. Since we're doing our last two flips, I'm going to bring the heat down pretty low to uh, about medium low. I'm going to baste it a couple of more times. And my olive oil is now warm for my asparagus. So we're going to take the asparagus that has been blanching. And what I'm doing here is I'm putting it on the cutting board. Now I'm just going to take some paper towels and just kind of pat that dry. Uh, main reason for that is we're going to put this in a pan with hot oil and water and oil don't go super well together. So we're going to dry those guys off. Is that when I get all those little um, oil sparks on my hands? Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. That is exactly it. So our... Okay, you can see the pan with the uh, olive oil. That's good. We're just putting these guys in here now. And so that's putting the um, blanched asparagus, into the asparagus yeah, after yeah. you dried them off into the pan that had the oil in it. Exactly. And I'm going to give them just a little pinch of salt over top. We'll salt the taste this again. We really like to cook with a little bit of salt there. We're gonna let those sizzle for a second, and then we're gonna flip our halibut back over one more time. It's gonna be getting a little delicate now, so be careful. We'll bring it right back over. Pieces off of there, piece of the pan. And we'll give it a quick shot of the butter. Basically, again, we're just uh, doing some of that blanching on top of there. And I am fully okay here. When I cooked it, we had this little section here that cracked, and so we can kind of see that it's also nice and opaque down in there. So I feel pretty good about where the halibut is. If you really want to, you typically don't have to do this with fish, especially a fresh fish, you can always temp it. I'd expect it to be close to 120 at this point. So we hit about 125. So that is certainly done. And we're just going to let it sit in that oil there for a second. And we'll come over to our asparagus. We have our tongs from earlier. I'll bring the asparagus over on this burner. And we just want to kind of roll these guys around a little just to kind of get the, the heat and a nice warm oil going. I don't like my asparagus to be overly cooked at all. Um, I kind of give it just a, a light saute if I blanch it. I like it to have a lot of crunch. If you like your asparagus a little softer, then uh, you might want to uh, cook a little longer than I do. Uh, or if your asparagus is uh, uh, super thin, but I just don't like sloppy asparagus. So I'm not even browning it here, right? I'm just coating it in the oil. 
I think this is a little bit. And basically, and basically warming it up there from the um, from uh, the time it's been in the blanching water. All right, let me turn that up. Yeah, the excitement with playing with big gas burners is uh, if you've got some oil floating around in there, you'll, uh, you'll definitely get those. If you ever do get a little flare up like that, all you've got to do is just kind of move it right off the heat and it just will just go right back down. Don't put water on it. Okay. So now, very last thing before plating is we have our quinoa. So we've let our quinoa sit. Now in the pot, it's ready to roll as well. What I'd like to do with the quinoa is I'm just going to transfer it over to another bowl. And I'm going to move, Kevin, I'm going to move this camera again over to the cutting board. Sounds good. All right. And then I'm going to take our wooden spoon and just kind of pop it down the bowl. I just find it's a little bit easier to fluff the quinoa whenever it's in the bowl, when in the uh, saute pan, or in the uh, saucepan. And we got it here. So by fluffing, you know, I'm just kind of moving my spoon through there a little bit, breaking it up a bit. And then with our final ingredients, we have our block of Parmesan. We have our toasted pine nuts. We have a nice little block of feta that we're gonna crumble uh, into the quinoa right at the very last second. Good to have a plate. I should eat right out of the can. And I've got a little bowl here. I'm gonna put my quinoa in this and uh, if you're having it just the quinoa, um, then you might want to use a bigger bowl. Um, That's just kind of like a little little side bowl. And we take our fish spatula. Oh, sorry, apologies. My brain ordering is a little off. We want to put our asparagus down first. Asparagus. I like to use... Uh, Odd numbers when I plate. So, got five pieces there. I've got one that's just going to be a little tester for me. I'm going to take our halibut, halibut down on there. I'll let our plate a little. If you want, uh, you know, you've got this delicious sauce, um, you know, this butter sauce. That'll also warm up the halibut just a little bit. Feel free to add just a little. I mean, I'm only going to add like a teaspoon of that over top of it just to kind of make it glisten a little bit. Then if you have your Y peeler, it's this guy right here. What we'll do is we'll just shave off a little bit of, uh, of parm. It's like a couple of pieces to go on to my asparagus. So this flavor is okay. Also adds a little bit of salt to it. Okay. And then we have our gremolata. And then putting that right on top of the halibut there. And I'm using uh, probably about a tablespoon of it, but again, you know, try it, see what you think, um, and how intense you want that to be. And that's just gonna roll down on the side. And then we have some pine nuts. We'll just put lay it along here. I don't like to be super precise with my pine nuts. I like them to be a little rusty. Touch it with some black pepper. And then, this is all extra, you don't have to do that. That's some finishing salt. I just like the, um, the crunch that finishing salt has whenever you're having something like a, uh, a, a softer fish. 
as we mentioned. If you still have your half lemon floating around, now's the time where you'd like. You can take that lemon. So what I did there is I just chopped those two ends off. I'm gonna look for some seeds, make sure there's no seeds in there. There's a little guy right there, I'll just kind of poke him out. Add a little, little lemon to the whole thing in case you wanna add more. Remember though, there is lemon in the uh, um, gremolata as well. So uh, depends on what your tasting's like. And then we'll come along here. Got the quinoa. Fluff that up whenever you're putting it. Uh, whenever you're putting it into the bowl. And again, this is uh, you know looking at this as a side to go with this dish. Um, but if this is your main to go with it, then uh, you know you'd add a little bit more for sure. Then break up some feta. Go inside there. In a smaller dish, so I'm I'm not going to do a uh, um, a whole big batch of it. And then the gremolata on the top. Use a little bit more on that one. And then a couple of fine nuts. So what you can do is a variant on this. If you're having the whole bowl of quinoa, you'll take your asparagus and you can chop your asparagus up into smaller pieces. So you have them like that and add that to your bowl. And you have a nice grain bowl with those other ingredients. And go this guy here, that guy there, move you over a little bit. And there we go. We have our halibut and asparagus and our quinoa and uh, uh, gremolata. Bravo.